every one of your customers has a hundred priorities. They yep. can only pay attention to four or five at a time. Which ones are they going to pay attention to? And then when they do, the multitude of information and options and all kinds of things is so overwhelming that they need you. They need you from the lens of being that consultant advisor, do the homework and tell them what they need. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. All right, welcome back to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is a sales superstar and to me, a historian on the topic. He has a focus on transparency and an advocate for the sales profession overall, not only a dynamic public speaker, but also a coach that is redefining the way businesses sell host of the sales history podcast. Make sure you go listen to that next. He draws from insights from the past and shares a lot of innovations in the future. Author of the transparency sale and most recently the transparent sales leader, founder of sales melon, Todd Capone. Todd. Dude, I just, uh, in the mail, I don't know for anybody who can see this, like I am constantly collecting literature. And so like when cool people are doing cool things on the weekends, I'm reading late 1800s, early 1900s books and magazines on the sales and sales leadership profession. This one, man, like I wish you could smell it because it smells like grandma's basement, but it's uh, 1912. Um, it's called Pushing to the Front by Orson Martin. This is like how to win friends and influence people 25 years before that actually came out. It is a classic. It was selling as like almost as much as the Bible back then. And I just got my hands on an original and I love it. I mean, I'd like cuddle up that, with it later. So that is unbelievable. And and I not to make a joke, but I, I grew up with a family that also had some some older relics. And I see the old phone in the background. And please tell me you're not making cold calls on that. <laughs> so that, by the way, so I drove three and a half hours to get this. I had it restored. It's a 1908 original. Um, it, uh, the, the wires work like the wires are in the inside. If you turn the handle, the bell rings. Um, I use that for anybody who cares as a um, kind of a representation of the tech world today in sales. I so, love. you know, so often when you're reading online, you're reading on LinkedIn, there's so much talk about like how technology is permeating every remaining crevice of the sales profession. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good thing, because if you go back, like the greatest sales technology revolution took place in 1876 when the notorious AGB, Alexander Graham Bell, made yep. the first telephone call. <laughs> and really, you know, by the 1910s, 1920s, it was revolutionizing sales outreach, sales communication, everything that we did. And it didn't take long after that for us to ruin it. Like salespeople, <laughs> we ruined this incredible gift that we were given, which is pick up the phone. I can reach out, I can scale, like I can do all those things where we needed technologies created to prevent salespeople from utilizing it through caller ID, voicemail and all that. Yep. And then that got so bad that we needed a do not call registry, which now has 221 million telephone numbers on it. Like AGB would be rolling over if he knew that we screwed it up so bad. And then we did the same thing with email. We yep. started doing the same thing with LinkedIn. We're doing it with video. And now a uh, you know AI is upon us, and I see people ruining that already. Like that that the point of the telephone here is just to be like realize that sales before the telephone was trusted, respected, admired as a profession mm -hmm. because we had to do it face to face, human to human, office to office, shake your hand, look you in the eyes. Technology caused us to lose our face and lose our connection to our customers. Mm -hmm. And the reputation of the sales profession went down along with it. And I think there's an opportunity to get it back. But if we use technology and get blinded by that dirty word scale, mm -hmm. we're, we're doing it wrong. Like, I think we got to take a step back and get our humanness back to sales. And I think that's an appropriate launching point for this conversation. I, I couldn't have teed it up better myself. And you know, I'm thinking that phone, when you made a call back then, people were probably excited to answer that phone. 
It was like, ah, someone's calling. I want to talk to them. I'm there. Now, how often all of us, I don't care who you are listening, if you get a call and you don't know that number, if it doesn't show up with a name, I don't ever answer them. Do you answer them, Todd? Zero. And that, yeah. that's funny because like doing what I do, um, when I was like my last role, I was the chief revenue officer of a fast growing tech company here in Chicago. The number of cold calls that I answered was, um, let's see, carry the, it was zero. <laughs> zero. Like never once would I, because I, you know, I was in a typical week, I had 30 to 35 meetings. Mm -hmm. There was like, my day was planned from the minute I got on the train to go downtown in the morning. Like I couldn't guide my day by random interruptions. There is an opportunity for like, there were companies that I did pick up the phone for, but mm -hmm. they did it the right way. They made deposits before they tried to make a withdrawal and I'll answer those, but yeah, random, I don't know you're calling and I don't know the number and I don't know you. 0% chance of picking up the phone. Even today when maybe I'm not in 30 to 35 meetings per week, but it's still the same thing. Like we are prediction machines and we're probably not gonna pick up the phone when we get those random calls. Maybe there's some people that are like, ooh, I get to mm -hmm. talk to somebody, but for me, the phone rings, it's an interruption 100% of the time. It is. And and we're going to get further into this and kind of the soft skills around that. You said, okay, what's the right way to do it versus the wrong way? I think that's some tactical stuff we can get into later, but I, I want to dig back into a few things that, that worry me about the sales profession. And they're the stats that we throw out every year, right? Mm -hmm. It's, hey, less and less time spent selling. Okay. Productivity less and less quota attainment. Okay. We're not hitting our numbers, but we continue to try and do, you said the dirty word of scale. We continue and try and do it with less personalization, more scale, more productivity. You had talked about, we've gone through four different economies recently mm -hmm. and, and that changes how we need to go to market or how we approach our customers but I'm not seeing the way we go outbound in sales or the way we approach sales changing too much. What are people missing? Oh my gosh, there's so much there. Um, <laughs> you know, like for one thing, like there's a, there's a recent data point that's getting all kinds of attention and it's mm -hmm. Gallup saying that 72% of buyers want a rep free experience. I don't, I don't know if you've seen yeah. that. Yeah, I saw 44% of millennials like, don't want to talk to sales. Yeah, well, all these stats. It's funny to me because I look at that and I'm like 72% don't. Who are these 28% that do? Like, I don't know anybody <laughs> that wants to talk to salespeople if they don't have to. And that's yeah. not new. That's, you know, the, the, there's a phrase, buyers no more nowadays. Mm -hmm. Right four words, buyers no more nowadays. That's actually a quote from Thomas Herbert Russell's 1912 book, Salesmanship. That's mm -hmm. a 111 year old quote where the proliferation of mail order and advertising was concerning the sales profession that, hey, like, are people going to need us in the future? Because they can do all the homework on, them, on their own. What happened? The sales profession flourished. We fast forward to 2015 and there was a... Um, Forrester report that came out where, and I guess in one could say it was like a state of sales report. There's another argument that it's just an opinion piece by one analyst, but either way, yeah. Forrester was reporting in 2015 that by 2020, 1 million B2B sales jobs would go away and hundreds of thousands of college students wouldn't graduate into the profession. Now what happened? The opposite happened, yeah. right? The opposite happened where the profession flourished. Now why? Well, there's a couple of things. Number one is more information available to buyers hasn't made it easier on them. It's actually made it harder. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two is we as human beings, we trigger purchase decisions when we can predict, not when we're convinced. All right. We are not buying when we're convinced. If we are convinced, we're probably pissed about it 20 minutes later. <laughs> we are prediction machines, right? Yeah. It's why when you're buying something online, all of you, you're not weirdos for doing this. You all read the negative reviews first, right? You skip the five, you go to the four, because you're trying to predict. And so the way that I see today and the future and where the profession continues to grow and flourish is if we take that lens and realizing that our buyers are trying to make a prediction they're overwhelmed by the multitude of information, some in conflict. They're trying to do that homework mm -hmm. themselves. 
when salespeople view their profession as being a service profession, that, hey, I'm here to help you predict, to help you achieve outcomes that you want to achieve, maybe achieve outcomes that you didn't think were possible. And I've done the homework. This is what you're going to love. This is what you're going to hate. Here's mm -hmm. the risk. Here's the concern. Here's the upside. Here's the downside. And when we, we do the homework for the buyer and bring it to them, and then they go do their own homework and find that it matches, we became you know, we become a consultant, an advisor, an aide who's making deposits. We're not there just trying to make withdrawals and convince, convince, convince. I think it starts there. Like, why has the profession flourished as information has grown? Because salespeople, the successful ones, have shifted and realized their role is to be a service and not be a necessary evil trying to convince people to do things. Well, and, and with the amount of content, with the amount of stuff we've put out there. I think you talked about this recently. We're now in a buying group at six to eight to 12. I mean, it could be more depending on the size of the deal. Yeah. They all come to the the buyer, all come to the table. I was talking to um, Cassandra Anderson. She's in RevOps. She goes, every one of us, when I come to the table and my team, we all have our own priorities. We don't let all those be known. Like, yeah, we have the company objective. Mm -hmm. But then I've got my priority in RevOps that I don't want Salesforce to be a mess. And my sales leaders got a priority that they have. And getting those things aligned as a team is tough. I mean, I think of that seller, like the really good ones, as almost like a counselor for the group. Yes. Which exactly. is a totally different position than when they come at you, like you're saying, spam cannons firing and let me convince you why you need this. Right. And we turn off. Yeah. And the, and the flip side, and I think this is where, this is the silver lining for, for sellers is the stat that I found fascinating on the back end of that self-service piece is that the highest level of buyer remorse comes from when you buy it yourself mm -hmm. with no help, no advisory, no support. Yeah. So we know the challenges out there. This this podcast we came on, it's all about EQ and the soft skills and the human elements. And you have you have hit the the absolute nerve on this of like people still buy from people they like and trust. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to your point, though, about like buyer remorse when you buy on your own, there's a story mm -hmm. that I always tell that like you remember a few years ago when Toys R Us was going on a business mm -hmm. and uh, they, they like they're going out of business. They're closing the stores. My kids were younger then. Um, but they had their, their like going out of business sale. And so like my wife and I and our two kids, we're, we're driving and my wife's like, hey, you know, Toys R Us has got this going out of business sale. Like, like, let's go. Yeah. And like my kids, they're like, no, ah! like the most exciting moment of their life. We're going to freaking Toys R Us. How awesome. Uh -huh. Well, we pull into the parking lot. Excitement, just like palpable. Just a uh, kind of Pulp Fiction style. Go to the end of the story first. Uh -huh. You know, 25 <laughs> minutes later. The kids are in their car seats. They've got a toy and they're both crying. Now, <laughs> why Why does this happen? Yes. Well, you, you think about walking into that store and, you know, you got multiple buyers, like you said, with multiple yeah. priorities. You got kids who are looking floor to ceiling, like just a place just packed with toys. And they're like, I want that. I want that. Oh, I love that. But what about that one? What The, 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 the number of options that they had was so overwhelming that they couldn't make a decision to the point where my wife is finally acting as the salesperson going, all right, listen, there's three that you liked. Yeah. Pick one out of those three. They're like, no, no, you, you have to pick one of those three. They picked one of those three, but they go out into the parking lot with their toy thinking that they left something better in the store and they missed yeah. their chance. Right. And that's, that's so much of what we've got as buyers. Every one of your customers has a hundred priorities. They yep. can only, pay attention to four or five at a time, which ones are they going to pay attention to? And then when they do, the multitude of information and options and all kinds of things is so overwhelming that they need you. They need you from the lens of being that consultant advisor, do the homework and tell them what they need. Tell them what to pick from, right? And help them see uh -huh. what the journey is like, help them predict what that outcome is going to be and give them the tools to go, is the juice worth the squeeze on this versus the other places I can spend my time, resources, and money. That's the role of the sales professional. It always should be, but especially into the future. And I'll leave you with a quote from mm -hmm. Arthur Sheldon in 1911. 
his book, The Art of Selling, he defined sales as this. He said, true salesmanship is the art, or I'm sorry, true salesmanship is the science of service. Grasp that thought firmly and never let go. I love that quote because that's I like, that it's still the science of service. In many cases, we have let go. Let's go back and grab it. And that's where the opportunity lies. I think you just just hit something nail on the head for sales leaders. You know, I, I always think of uh, Ted Lasso watching that recently and putting the believe sign up there. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe it's not believe for sellers. Maybe it's a service, service first. Well, yeah, that was uh, in 1916, the yeah. uh, first sales conference of all time. It was called the World Sales Congress, attended wow. by 3,000 people in Detroit, Michigan. Um, from and there's dignitaries from all over the world, a sales conference. The keynote speaker, imagine this, was then U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. So imagine a sales conference wow. today where the president of the United States is the keynote. But like, there's two things to think about there. Number one is the whole motto and the mantra of the conference was what you just said. So one word, service. And number two is why did the sitting U.S. president keynote a sales conference in a time where the rest of the world is falling into World War One? Like he's got some priorities going on. Yeah. But at the time, sales was viewed as the vessel by which the United States would gain its foothold as a world superpower. Salespeople selling the right products to the right companies at the right time, it lifted all boats. You know, yeah. and when we like the whole economy grows as a result of it, we all win. And so salespeople cease to be selfish. And that was really the message is provide a service, help those companies, because when they succeed, we all succeed. And when we all succeed, you succeed. Right. And so that's yeah. it's such an interesting concept, but service, right? One word. Well, and so fascinating because you look at even where the U.S. economy is positioned, we are a service-based economy. We are not a production-based economy. Like we have in the last hundred years only scaled that side more than anything else. And, yeah. you know, you look at the Accentures, the Deloitte's, the, all of these massive, massive companies. I think there's something to be said about those consultancies and how they've gone about it. They changed their name from sales to consulting, right? That was a good, yep. that was a good positioning move. Right. And, and now they're the ones that you actually have to sell the idea to because they're the ones who are actually doing the service with the customer. And they own that customer relationship better than the technology vendors or the producers. Yeah. And that brings up a, a good point that, mm-hmm. um, you know, so much of what we teach salespeople and like Mm -hmm. kind of old school approaches and everything was grounded in a time when the sale was the peak of the mountain. Yeah, And like you said, like, you know, we're a service economy. Well, we're really a service economy in this subscription or as a service economy, right? Yeah, Where the deal is now merely an early milestone on the path to acquiring companies that not only buy, but they stay, they buy more and they become advocates for us. And that's why like the thing you'll hear me say a lot is, you know, we've got to play the long game, of course. We, you know, of course you got to play the long game. But I believe that because of the proliferation of reviews, feedback, access to peer reviews and peer feedback, like you can connect with anybody, that the long game helps you win the short game too. Like if, if we're winning oh, deals you. that we shouldn't be winning, that one win is probably causing us to lose four or five deals that we'll never even have heard about or know exist. Because that one person that bought and hated it is able to share it so, you know, emphatically and so quickly and bad news travels fast. We've got to play the long game, but the long game helps everybody win the short game too. Well, bringing new products to market, that's been the space I've been in for the last six, seven years. It's all about kind of that zero to one journey, right? Yeah. And to get that flywheel to spin, you're spot on. Like if I go sell three deals, and they churn out in the first six months, I didn't get the testimonials, I didn't get the reviews, I didn't get the traction I need Mm -hmm. to start getting that wheel to move forward. And I'm almost five steps backwards because I burned a lot of resource and I didn't end up with the gold because I was reading a report from Trust Radius this morning. Mm -hmm. What buyers actually want in terms of content Everything that we produce in marketing and everything that we produce in sales and all the pitch decks are so far down on their list of care 
Yeah. It's insane. All they want is the reviews, the the personal introductions, the someone like yourself saying, hey, I've talked to five different sales leaders. This has worked for them. It can work for you. That's what we're going back to. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that you know, the, the concept of my first book, The Transparency yeah. Sale, is that, right? And that trust radius data, like I've talked, I can't remember the CEO's yeah. name, but like I've interacted with him about it before too, because it's based on this whole concept that, you mm-hmm. so, I was the CRO of a fast growing tech company in Chicago called Power Reviews. And you could probably guess from the name we were in the review space, but mm-hmm. we had done a study with Northwestern University that was looking at right, how do consumers act? What do they do when a website's acting as a salesperson? Mm-hmm. There's three data points that came out of it, two of which changed my life. Like it only happened to a nerd where like like lunatic, I quit my job and wrote a book. but they're really relevant to why that trust radius data is saying what it's saying. Mm -hmm. The three data points, the first one that didn't change my life was that we all read reviews today. Like when we're buying something we haven't bought before, that's of medium to high consideration. So not like a pack of gum, but electronics, clothing, you know, whatever that matters, we all read reviews, right? So no surprise Mm -hmm. there, but here's the two that changed my life. Number one was that, when a website's acting as a salesperson and we're reading the reviews, 85% of us go to the negative reviews first, right? We skip the five stars and we go right to the fours, threes, twos, and ones. And if that's not odd enough, the second piece is that a product on a five-star scale that has an average review score between a four, two, and a four, five. And this is across all product categories. Some skew higher, some skew lower, but that 4.2 to 4.5 is the optimal average star rating for purchase conversion, meaning a product that has negative reviews right under it will sell mm-hmm. better than a product that is nothing but perfect five-star reviews. And as a matter of fact, a product that has nothing but perfect five-star reviews sells at about the same conversion rate as a product that's got an average review score of around a 3.25, which kind of sucks, right? Like that's not good. And mm-hmm. the point being that, we as individuals, as human beings, and that, that's again where the website's acting as a salesperson. I yeah. did all the research and found, wait, it's not just when a website's acting as a salesperson. That's the way we're wired as human beings, that we are prediction machines. We know at a subconscious level that perfection does not exist. And if all we're hearing is five-star speak, i.e. we're awesome, and here's a case study, and here's references that are going to talk about how awesome... It literally, our brains can't process that. We can't predict. We need the negative first, which is why that trust radius data talks about that buyers, they're trying to predict. They want to see the reviews. They want to see what can go wrong, what the risks is. You know, what? that's that's why I think the future of sales, again, gets back to being a service profession that the best salespeople play in the long game, which helps mm-hmm. win the short game, are the yeah. ones that are coming to the table going, hey, we're great at this and we're not great at this. And let's figure out like what's important to you. Hey, our pricing is up here. If that's going to be a problem, let's talk about it now versus three months from now, right? Embrace what you give up to be great at your core. And that helps you qualify in and out faster, but it triggers faster purchase decisions. It improves your win rate. And the best part is it makes it really hard on your competitors to message against you. When you're the one revealing what you're not great at, when yeah. they come in and they're like, we're awesome and they suck, the customer now trusts you and doesn't trust them. And so that that's kind of the magic in the trust radius data. But all of this data is salespeople. Like if you're in the sales profession, there's magic in leading with what you give up to be great at your core, right? And qualifying out because that will trigger the purchase decisions and improve trust right out of the gate on a bed. Like you'll be on a foundation that will give you a lot more rope going forward too. You're making me think as as you're saying this, I'm thinking through my past purchases Mm -hmm. and and you're spot on in terms of, you know, I think of, we just did a house remodel and some of the stuff, you know, they go, oh, well, you could do this or you could do this. And that person that talked me through it and didn't say, oh no, this is exactly what you need to do. We've got you all set up. This is perfect. We're going to put this here. It's going to be perfect for you to, but the person who said, here, think about these things. Here's the pros. Here's the cons. I remember even one guy sitting down on a piece of paper with me, he goes, fold it in half, hot dog, mm-hmm. write all the pros on one side, 
okay, let's flip it over. Let's write all the cons on the other. Now go take this to your, at the time, girlfriend or fiance, but now wife, mm -hmm. take this to your wife and go over it with her. Yeah. That was the person we ended up going with. That's right. the person we actually purchased from. And I didn't have the hair remorse. Providing yeah. a service as an advisor and a consultant and not a salesperson. And I think you almost then, you almost process like in the, in the like you said, we're predictors. I'm thinking, okay, I already accepted what I may not be absolutely in love with because I knew it up front. So now I don't have buyer remorse. Exactly. It was accepted. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I, I've got a little side story. Um, so, so yeah, the, I get this inbound lead. And mm -hmm. it's a CRO of a significant organization. We get on the phone and I'm, you know, we're talking just about like, hey, when you think about the fundamentals of your team across your revenue organization, like what are the priorities? And he was like, listen, I, top of funnel is a problem. We need support and help with like our prospecting, whether it's cold calling, social selling, like just understanding, you know, using LinkedIn Navigator and maximizing all that. Like that's I know we've got a big hole there. And we, like I talked to him a little bit about the outcomes and all of that that he's trying to get to. And then I said this. I said, listen, um, I, what you're trying to achieve, I totally understand. It's like, it, absolutely. What I'd love to do is um, I, I could teach on that stuff. I could. Yeah. But if you made a list of the top 50 people that teach top of funnel stuff, I'd come in at about number 47. Um, yeah. I what I would love to do is I know I've got a list in my brain and I know from my customers of the top three, I would love to connect you to those. And like, those are three people that you choose any of them. You're going to freaking have raving successes on your hands from those. So mm -hmm. like, let's do that. And the guy was like, wow, that's awesome. I love that. Man, they, that thank you. Thank you. Wait, <laughs> but what is it you do? Like, what's your area of focus? I'm like, well, you know, here's where I focus, right? And I talked them through that. Now, yeah. here's a couple of things. Number one is I made the referrals and that was great. They got to where they wanted to go. Number two mm -hmm. is it built trust in a way that now they're a customer of mine too, because Amazing. there were priorities that lined up really, really well, but I built trust and I was an advisor. The funny mm -hmm. thing though, is I told this story on an interactive keynote I was doing recently for a company's kickoff. And I was like, yeah, I told them it's not what I do. And I would love to refer you to somebody that does do it. When I told that, I looked in the chat on Zoom and somebody wrote the word, no, right? The super long no. And I, I saw that and I stopped and I was like, all right, wait, like why the no? Like, tell me a little bit about that. And they're like, well, Todd, I don't know if you noticed, but the economy kind of sucks right now. And when we get an inbound lead and it's anywhere close to something that like, you said you were number four, like you could do it. You grab it and you do it. Like you, we, you can't just let revenue go and much less turn it over to somebody who could be considered a yeah. competitor. Like, are you crazy? And I'm like, listen, you've got to, again, in this economy, you've got to yeah. play the long game, right? You've got to build trust. And if, if, if the stat that I keep telling companies to look at is when you're losing a deal, how long does it take you to lose? And can we shorten that? Like that time to loss yeah. is so important right now because your most valuable item that you can turn to revenue, right? Like when you mm -hmm. think about your inventory of what you sell, the most important thing is your time, right? Mm -hmm. And if we're spending time on opportunities that we are not the best suited to be able to perform, you might win that deal. But like I said, you're going to lose three or four others uh, yeah. that you didn't even know about in this economy. And we've got to play the long game right now. I think that's it's it's key for sellers and for revenue leaders and even leaders of companies to hear that because yeah. on the marketing side, I can say the same thing. I see everybody optimizing for demand gen. Mm -hmm. I see everybody optimizing for how many leads can we get? Oh yeah, every that dollar crazy. crazy. Yes, every dollar has to equivalent to this many opportunities and this many leads. Yes, but the best and and most successful companies right now that are winning in this place are the ones that for the last five years invested in brand so and in trust. Can I tell a quick story on that one? Yes, because please. That's something that like I'm the, this client that I'm consulting that I had the call yeah. with just before this, we were talking about this idea that, um, you know, like they keep seeing like the marketing department needs to generate more leads, like more leads. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, every single lead has a cost, every lead. 
that comes yeah. in. Somebody's got to look at, somebody's got to touch, somebody's got to call, somebody's got to demo. We need to brand what we give up to be great at our core. And I'll give mm -hmm. you two examples. Like think about B2C, right? Like if you've ever been to your, like I'm sure your favorite retailer in the world is Ikea, right? Like now, I mean, but Ikea, like you walk in and they give you a map, right? Like you know that you're in for hell on earth the minute you walk in, if you got to get a map to walk through a retailer. <laughs> You can yes. find what you're looking for. There's no salesperson around to help you out. You got to write down the code or take a picture of it with your phone of where you get to go to the warehouse, pull the 100 pound box onto a cart that doesn't have brakes, jam it in the back of your car Tetris style, drive it home with a souvenir injury, open the box, there's 150 parts, and the only word on the work instruction is Svarta or some yeah. <laughs> name, right? And well, that sounds like hell on earth, Todd. Like, Oh, wait, did I mention that Ikea is the number one furniture retailer in the world for 14 straight years? Yeah. And they, they, why? Because Ikea brands that, listen, you're going to find it, pick it, pack it, shove it, assemble it. But yeah. we do that so we can give you modern Scandinavian design furniture that you didn't pay much for. And there's good meatballs upstairs. But besides yeah. the, point, <laughs> the, the point being, like you look at the most successful B2C companies in the world. Everybody that walks into an Ikea knows exactly mm -hmm. what they're getting themselves into. And they leave having had those expectations met to the point where they're like, yeah, we'll come back again when my kids yeah. destroy the furniture that we just bought. And, you know, another one is Costco. Yeah. Like, one of the most loved brands in America right now. Yeah. yeah. And number two retailer in the world behind yeah. in, the, in the U.S. behind Walmart. Like you, you need to actually pay to walk in. Like you got to get a subscription card out. Like you paid the boxes floor to ceiling, like, hey, uh, could you get some ranch dressing? Well, there's only <laughs> one brand, it's Hidden Valley Ranch, you better like that. Oh, and here's almost a gallon. Gunk. Yeah. Right? And like, oh, you need a toothbrush? Here's a half dozen. Like, we don't even give it a second thought. And like, Linda's at the door checking your receipt to make sure you didn't steal anything. And uh -huh. they, they don't bag what you bought. They give you a like, hey, do you want a dirty old box that's sitting under the cash register to put it? Like, it's crazy that their subscription renewal rate is like 98%. Why? Yeah. Because they brand what they give up to be great at their core. I don't see enough B2B brands doing this. I think it's a tremendous opportunity. I, I, I think it is. And I think it's also you lean into the negatives and then you just stand absolutely dead fast on making that promise on the stuff I am going to deliver. Well, you become and it makes it so that's doable. It, exactly. Yeah. Like if you need, if I right now was like, Tim, having a party, can you go get the provisions, paper plates, paper cup, buy like a fruit tray and a vegetable tray and all that. The first thing that springs to mind is, okay, Costco, right? Yeah. Like, I think that that's the opportunity for like, when you think about anything in tech, there's not too many decisions that you need to make that you've got a default answer to. Like Zoom took off during a time where it was like, hey, we all need to get online. We, like everybody's like Zoom yeah. and they started calling it Zoom, right? Like Xerox was the copiers of a million years ago. You need some tissues, Kleenex, right? Like you become associated with a certain type of brand. And I think that just, I, it's a tremendous opportunity, especially in a market where there's so much information and so much choice. Oh, absolutely. Because again, you go back to, well, you're in every conversation. I can only imagine that if you're a seller for a B2B brand like that, it's, it's got to be an easier day. Yeah. You're not dealing with top of funnel as much, right? You're dealing with, okay, now I'm in every deal. What are the deals that actually fit best for my company? Exactly. Rather yeah. than scrambling. And, and when we talked prior to this episode, you talked about, and I want to dive into this because this is the personal side of this. Mm -hmm. We live in quarter by quarter, week by week, show the numbers, get stuff done, whether it's the marketing side with leads or the sales side with closing deals and quota. Yeah. But you said the worst kind of motivation comes from this. And I want to unpack that because motivation is such a big piece of EQ, mm -hmm. but it changes how we go about these things. It's kind of the, I always think that's what causes the reactiveness that we see in the market today. Mm -hmm. What is that bad motivation? How does it show up in sales? How do we overcome some of it? <clears throat> well, I mean, the old phrase is, you know, sales reps are coin operated, right? Mm -hmm. Like we've heard that since the beginning of the time. And if you mm -hmm. as a leader believe that to be true, then you're right, but you're doing it wrong, you know, just to let you know. <laughs> so <laughs> that, like, I, I, you know, 
the best companies in the best environments and the biggest successes I've seen have been in those companies that realize that like variable compensation and metrics and rewards that um, are seen as a reward for doing work that we love to do instead of the reason you do it, like that's when everybody wins. And so like, just to take a step back and to really think through this idea of as revenue leaders, our, our role, like we've got a role to hit our numbers, we've got all that kind of stuff, but the most successful revenue leaders are studying and understand the science of intrinsic inspiration. And how do we create a culture where our team wants to show up every day, wants to stay, wants to do their best, and wants to advocate for us as leaders, but our company, and then our products to their friends and their customers, right? There's, there's a model that I had created, and I'll rattle off the model for everybody if you're, if you're interested. But I, I created a model, I call it the praise model, but it incorporates the six things that drive us intrinsically to show up every day, right? So praise, you can mm -hmm. probably guess they're, they're every, so number one is the P, which is predictability. Like okay. we as human beings, we do our best work when we can predict, right? Where we're, there's certainty, there's consistency, when we go to bed at night, we know what we're getting ourselves into the next day. We sleep better. We're more creative. We do better. Predictability. And that's like incumbent upon leaders to create environments where your reps, mm -hmm. like you're consistent, but you can predict what's going on. Right. And the, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, we could probably talk about that topic for an hour. But one of the things that I see companies doing wrong in this market is they don't say anything about the economy. And as a result of the reps in your team, they're looking around, seeing their, their buddies getting laid off in different companies. Yeah. And they're probably going to bed at night wondering, is that going to happen to me? Leaders create predictability, embrace what you know, embrace what you don't know by being transparent. Like, Hey, there's the things we can't predict and then create yeah. certainty around when you'll give updates around those. And then as individual leaders figure out, whether or not you are a consistent leader. Because if you're inconsistent, you're driving us, or everybody's brains crazy. So predictability is number one. Number two is the R of praise, which is recognition. Like we do our best yep. work when we're recognized for our efforts, we're given status, we're validated, we're given feedback. The A yep. is aim, yep. which is what's the aim of our work? If the aim of the individual's work is to hit their number, you're doing it wrong. I'm talking yeah. about the impact, the mission, the purpose. What does my work mean to you as my leader, my company, my customers, and my customers' customers? Can you draw that line? Like, what's the impact that you're making? So many stories here, but that's a huge opportunity. Like, create that aim. Make sure that your reps know that their work is much more important than just hitting their number. The mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. is independence meaning we do our best work when we're given independence, we're given trust and resources and we're not micromanaged, right? Like we're given the tools to do our best work with minimal supervision. Mm -hmm. Yes, security, we do our best work when we feel safe and secure, when we don't feel like there's a hatchet swinging behind our head when we're part of a team, there's relatedness. And then the E yeah. is equitability, meaning is it fair? Is the juice yeah. worth the squeeze? Am I getting the just rewards that I should be getting for the effort, the time, the dollars, whatever I'm putting in. And does it match what other people that are doing similar stuff do? Like nothing drives disengagement faster than politics and other people getting paid more for doing less work. So that's the praise model. But like, I think that's a huge opportunity for leaders that nobody ever teaches them the science of intrinsic inspiration. And I'm hoping to get that word out and help leaders create better cultures. We, we need some more praise. I, I agree with you in terms of not only I'm thinking first and foremost, it's, it's get us out of a state of fight or flight, right? The, yeah. the, the reptilian brain that's going, oh shit, I just need to go and I need yeah. to survive because nobody's getting creative or having any really good lasting conversations there. We're not building relationships. Everybody then looks like a target. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then on the back end, I love how the last thing you talked about was compensation. Mm -hmm. That's the very last. Yeah, exactly. It, it comes, it comes back to, you know, am I, and, and here's an interesting conundrum I see in the marketing side. LinkedIn has been this great place where, and just like trust radius or all of these different review sites, 
I'm amazed at the size of some of these companies and how none of their workforce or very few of their workforce engage or will even endorse the products that they work every single day, day in and day out, selling, marketing, servicing, but they will never even go to, like you said, their family or their friends or their personal professional network mm -hmm. and endorse the product. Yeah. It's that a should job. be a big call out. Yeah, exactly. It's just a job then. And that's... Yeah. All right, Todd. So, you know, with all of this going on in the market, what excites you about the future of sales? Because I think there's a lot of motivation to change the profession and really have it evolve in the next few years. And there's a lot of opportunity for people. Yeah, it's funny. I just had a conversation with a guy that you've probably heard of, but like he's a you know thought leader. And he asked me, he was like, what grade would you give the sales profession today? And I, I said a C plus. And he was like, C plus, I give it an F. And he's going on and on. I'm like, wait, dude, hold on. Well, let's think throughout history. So yeah. 110 years ago, like I said, Woodrow Wilson's keynoting sales conferences. Sales is a trusted, respected, admired profession. At the time, sales was taught at pretty much every university. It was actually taught in high schools in the 1910s. Wow. Like in Boston alone, there was 11 public high schools that were teaching sales. Like why? Because there was demand, right? Mm -hmm. Supply and demand, like everything. Like who's going to offer a class that nobody wants to sign up for? Well, imagine you fast forward the 1950s and 1960s, all gone. Sales not taught in any university, any high school. And as a matter of fact, corporations would come to um, university campuses to recruit recent mm -hmm. college graduates. The college graduates wouldn't sign up for the interviews. Like the whole, like they would rather be unemployed than be in sales back then. It was wow. so gross. Like the sales profession was viewed horribly. Now let's fast forward to today. We're back to where there's over 300 universities offering sales curriculum. Why? Because yeah. there's demand for it, right? And people are starting to view it again as being a profession where they can make money, they can have a level of independence, but they can actually be, you know, like a helpful servant to customers and help them achieve outcomes. And it's not viewed in the old gold chains, plaid jacket type of ways <laughs> of you know 40 years ago. I think yep. that that's a positive sign. And you combine that with what I'd said about, you know, the, the constant predictions of the demise of the sales profession. And every time we do that, what happens? The sales profession flourishes because we see the challenges and we adjust and we optimize to what customers really need, which is our help, our support to do the homework for them, to be, I guess Arthur Sheldon said, the science of service, right? Grasp that mm -hmm. thought firmly and never let go. I see more of that. And I see people really glomming onto the, the message of transparency that I'm teaching and all of these different elements. And you look across LinkedIn and most of the content that's being shared really comes from a place of being a good hearted individual. Yeah. And the more of that we see, the more it'll permeate and the more it'll go from generation to generation. And in my lifetime, I would love to see the sales profession not drag the bottom of Gallup's annual trusted professions list along with mm -hmm. politicians. Like it would be nice to pop that up a little bit. I mean, maybe that's wishful thinking, but I see us making progress to getting back to our service roots. Well, and it goes back to branding the sales profession in your own organization of what that role is, because I think it is an, it's, it's a channel of building trust. It's a stronger channel of building trust in a world that's gone very digital. Yes. Yeah. And if we look at it that way, like it, it is the face to face, whether it's face to face or not, or over a screen, you're the person in the sales organization that I can hold accountable because I can't hold the billboard accountable and I can't hold the marketing email accountable. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so it's an elevated role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just at Florida State University. We're doing some science research with them and, and testing our solution in live enterprise environments and in classroom environments. Met some of the students. They were super involved in their campus. They were super involved in taking people around tours. Lef Bonnie took us through through FSU, and he's one of the, the lead professors over at the Sales Institute there. It's amazing the enterprise companies that are now supporting and building into those, those colleges and really like giving the resources to build a farm league, so to say. Well, yeah, it's cool. When you look at why university level education went away in even the 1920s. The Great mm -hmm. Depression obviously killed a lot of it. But 
it was viewed by companies as being rigorous, but um, unapplicable. Like they they were mm -hmm. learning things that when they get to the companies, they were unwinding and rewinding again. I see so many of these universities creating these labs and partnering with companies and creating environments that to a certain extent actually do ready college students for the sales profession, whereas that was never the case. And I think that's going to help too, as long as those universities are doing what I think they're doing, which is teaching it the right way. Yeah. Well, and, and teaching the skills of selling, I think rather than I, I always, companies sometimes feel a little short-sighted, not all, but some where it's all product knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And when we did the surveys, you know, you get, you go into the research, it's like a buyer doesn't want product knowledge. And in today's world, as you were talking more educated, they definitely don't want the product knowledge because they got the speeds and feeds on the website already. That's marketing's right. doing, I think, a better job there. Mm -hmm. But then sales needs to, again, elevate and transform. And I, I'm excited. I think to your point, it's a great place to be in sales. And this next era, this next generation is going to change it quite a bit. Yeah, exactly. And I'll leave you with one quote, my favorite yes. sales quote of all time for everybody to just grasp onto. So Arthur Sheldon's is a quick number two, right? That uh -huh. you know, true salesmanship is the science of service. My favorite quote of all time comes from a guy named Arthur Dunn. It's 1922 book, The Science of Selling and Advertising. It's actually, it's got a whole page dedicated to it. Um, and that the page just says this, if the truth won't sell it, don't sell it. That's it's a great, right oh, exactly. it's it's great. Like, it's for everybody. Yeah, like great. that's, that, that's the way back then it's the future, right? If the truth won't sell it, don't sell it. Arthur Dunn, you bring a tear to my eye. <laughs> I, 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 so much knowledge from this and so optimistic to where the sales profession can go. Mm -hmm. And so much of it, what I'm amazed at. And every time I hear your, your, cause you are truly a historian and an educator of the trade. And I have got to say, you think back a hundred years before all of this technology, they were having probably better close rates, better response rates, more time spent talking to customers, less time updating CRM and all that yeah. stuff. They focused on the soft skills. And today you've totally validated that for me, that that's what's going to win in the future. Well, yeah. And remember, they were all remote, right? Like yep. they weren't coming to offices and making phone calls. They didn't even have phones, right? They're out in the field and they're wiring back their reports on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Like that's... yeah. I mean, we, that's that's what wins. Let's go. I love it. I love it. Well, Todd, where can people connect with you? Where can they find you? Yeah, I mean, I've written the two books, The Transparency Sale and The Transparent Sales Leader. They're wherever you find your books. Uh, you can find me at toddcapone.com or on LinkedIn. Um, and then if you're a nerd for the history of sales, the Sales History Podcast is available anywhere where you listen. And I post daily on Twitter and Instagram, just little quotes, pictures, quips, comics from sales history's past at sales historian on both. If you're just a nerd, again, that's a total hobby for me, just an outlet, but I'd love it if you're interested in it to follow along. Todd, thank you so much. And also if you're in the Chicago area, find this man on LinkedIn, take him out. I don't know if you love pizza, if you like the Chicago dogs, what your favorites are. I always feel like when I get into that city, there's a list of things I got to go, go visit and see. But, uh, you know, if you're in the Chicago area and connect with them as well, um, great sales community out there. And I know we've worked with other people that, that you're close with in that area and a shout out to all the sellers in, uh, in Chicago. So Todd, thank you so much for joining me on another episode of B2B EQ. It has been a lot of fun. It has. I could uh, talk all day. So thanks for having me. Hey, and to our listeners, thanks so much for listening. Make sure you uh, listen in wherever you catch your podcasts or catch the video on YouTube. You can see uh, his phone in real life and what we were talking about at the start of this episode, a great piece and a relic. And uh, if that phone rings, you better be answering it, Todd. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've got, this is, I'm getting to a point where I might not almost create a sales history museum. Just every week I'm collecting more and more stuff. So follow along for more on that. I'm excited too. And for another episode of B2B EQ, we will see you next time. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.